this is this is stuff that that really would be magic, that would be considered magic um, in, in times past. In fact. I think it actually goes beyond that because there are many things that we take for granted today that weren't even imagined in, in times past. They weren't even in the realm of magic. So it actually goes, goes beyond that. So I thought, well, you know, if, if, if I can do some of those things, basically if, if, if I can advance technology, then that, that's like magic and that would be really cool. Um, and the, the, I always had sort of a slight existential crisis because I was trying to figure out what does it all mean? Like, what's the purpose of things? And um, I came to the conclusion that if, if we can advance the, 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 the knowledge of the world, if we can do things that expand the scope and, and, and scale of consciousness, then we're better able to ask the right questions and become more enlightened. And, and that's really the only way forward. Welcome to TopCast, part two of chapter nine, Optimism. That was Elon Musk, who of course is just getting on and doing what's fun and along the way solving lots of problems and improving things for people of today and tomorrow. That was him speaking at Caltech during a commencement speech, I think back in 2018. In today's episode, there's a real focus on optimism as applied to people, to our institutions and to us as individuals. People are knowledge creators, and we just heard from Elon there that he has felt that his calling was to create knowledge, and quite right. That's us. That's our nature. If anything is our nature, it's to create knowledge. We don't all have to be creating knowledge about rockets or rapid transportation systems. We might just be creating knowledge in our own lives about how to best have tomorrow be better than today. But we're all striving to solve our problems. We're all equal in that. So let's continue. Continuing with the book. A further misconception is Hawking's analogy between our civilization and pre-enlightenment civilizations. As I as I shall explain in chapter 15, there is a qualitative difference between those two types of civilization. Culture shock need not be dangerous to a post-enlightenment one. Now I'm skipping a little bit. And David writes, in the case of our civilization, the precautionary principle rules itself out. Since our civilization has not been following it, a transition to it would entail reining in the rapid technological progress that is underway. And such a change has never been successful before. So a blind pessimist would have to oppose it on principle. So, and this is me, um, in other words, just for a little bit of uh, exposition on just that bit, which um, I found um, uh, subtle, is that our civilization is the one that has been making progress. So in a way, the precautionary principle, the precautionary principle says, uh, avoid making big changes because they're dangerous. Uh, avoid making progress because it's dangerous. In this case, it would seem to implore us not to make any big changes to our society, which is the very society that's undergoing big changes. It's kind of self-refuting. Well, it is self-refuting in that way. And um, David writes, This may seem like logic chopping, but it is not. The reason for these paradoxes and parallels between blind optimism and blind pessimism is that those two approaches are very similar at the level of explanation. Both are prophetic. Both purport to know unknowable things about the future of knowledge. And since at any instant our best knowledge contains both truth and misconception, prophetic pessimism about any one aspect of it is always the same as prophetic optimism about the other. For instance, Reese's worst fears depend upon the unprecedentedly rapid creation of unprecedentedly powerful technology such as civilization destroying bioweapons. If Reese is right that the 21st century is uniquely dangerous, and if civilization nevertheless survives it, it will have had an appallingly narrow escape. Our final century mentions only one other example of a narrow escape, namely the Cold War. So that will make two narrow escapes in a row. Yet by that standard, civilization must already have had a similarly narrow escape during the Second World War. For instance, Nazi Germany came close to developing nuclear weapons, the Japanese Empire did successfully weaponize bubonic plague, and had tested the weapon with devastating effect in China, and had plans to use it against the United States. Many feared that even a conventionally won victory by the Axis powers could bring down civilization. Churchill warned of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Though, as an optimist, he worked to prevent that. In contrast, the Austrian writer Stefan Zwieg and his wife committed suicide in 1942, in the safety of neutral Brazil, because they considered civilization to be already doomed. So that would make it three narrow escapes in a row. But was there not a still earlier one? 
In 1798, Malthus had argued in his influential essay On Population that the 19th century would inevitably see a permanent end to human progress. He had calculated that the exponentially growing population at the time, which was a consequence of various technological and economic improvements, was reaching the limit of the planet's capacity to produce food. And this was no accidental misfortune. He believed that he had discovered a law of nature about population and resources. First, the net increase in population in each generation is proportional to the existing population. So the population increases exponentially, or in geometrical ratio as he put it. But second, when food production increases, for instance as a result of bringing formerly unproductive land into cultivation, the increase is the same as it would have been if that innovation had happened at any other time. It is not proportional to whatever the population happens to be. He called this, rather idiosyncratically, an increase in arithmetical ratio and argued that population, when unchecked, increases in geometric ratio. Subsistence increases only in arithmetic ratio. A slight, in, a slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison with the second. His conclusion was that the relative well-being of humankind in this time was a temporary phenomenon and that he was living at a uniquely dangerous moment in history. The long-term state of humanity must be an equilibrium between the tendency of populations to increase on the one hand and on the other starvation, disease, murder and war, just as happens in the biosphere. In the event, throughout the 19th century, a population explosion happened, much as Malthus had predicted. Yet the end to human progress that he had foreseen did not, in part because food production increased even faster than the population. Then during the 20th century, both increased farther still. I'll pause there. This is a uh, hobby horse of mine, I suppose. I've catalogued some other people who've made similar prophecies of doom over the decades. They do happen rather regularly now. There's uh, people who appear in the media all the time talking about the doom that is to come. There's money to be made in doomsaying. The media likes the pessimists, but not so much the optimists. If you want to read some more criticism of Malthus and those who followed in his footsteps all the way through to today, uh, you can Google my essay that I've titled Cosmological Economics, Why Infinite Growth is No Bad Thing. And that's my summary of Malthusian pessimism over the last few decades and alternatives to it, um, following David, of course, especially in this present chapter. Anti-humanism and pessimism are tied together, or as I like to say, pessimism broadly speaking is the fundamental field out of which those other special cases are excitations. Those excitations of the pessimistic field are things like anti-humanism and socialism or other forms of authoritarianism or anti-natalism and certain kinds of effective altruism and so on. The effective altruists will get upset at me, but um, <laughs> if you go to the EA website, the www.effectivealtruism.org website, and you just uh, go to their about section, which is um, the article titled Introduction to, Effective Altru uh, Introduction to Effective Altruism, it's basically a catalogue of all these concerns we find elsewhere. Um, they're very much worried, like Bostrom is, about existential risk, and they think that we need to have some form of redistribution. Um, that, that's the kind of the theme, but they, they suggest that you, you give to charity in order to, to redistribute the money. I don't think they're, they're, not, they're not really forthcoming with the top-down authoritarian approach yet. Um, I always get suspicious when altruism doesn't begin with either oneself um, or with one's local community, but is then focused on these massive global things. Um, because the more distant you get from the problem you're trying to solve, the less you tend to know about it. Uh, Will McCaskill, the, the philosopher, one of the people who are credited with um, uh, coming up with a lot of the philosophy surrounding effective altruism, um, he talks about this case of the play pump. The play pump was an invention, which seemed like a good idea at the time, to help people in Africa pump water from wells. The old hand pumps seemed to be too much work, so they invented this thing called the play pump that kids could jump on and play like a merry-go-round and push around and it would pump water as well. Um, as it turned out, the play pump is a terrible idea because kids don't want to play on it. It's too hard. And so now you have a situation where in certain places in Africa, um, if the play pump still exists, it has to be pushed in a rather undignified way by the old women of the village. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that if you yourself are not in, if you yourself are not experiencing the problem, 
and you try and solve someone else's problem without consulting them. So what, probably the best of the bad bunch is to simply give them money, right? to give them cash. If you're going to um, force a solution onto anyone, well, here, have some money. Now, we can get into the political ideas about the liability of giving money. The, the actual solution, of course, to people in poverty is to trade with them, is to find something of value that they can give to you. And there's always something of value that they can give to you, always. People are creative, unique individuals, and given the opportunity, they will sell you something and you will want to buy it. Um, and so this is the way, this, this, this idea of having free trade, of allowing people to enter wealthy markets who themselves aren't wealthy and then to improve their lot. This is what history shows works and reduces and will eliminate poverty if we allow it to. Um, Top-down solutions tend to do quite the opposite. They are pessimistic ideas about how people's creativity doesn't have sufficient value that we would like to invest in or that we more wealthy people would like to invest in. But I think that's simply false. Um, okay, let's continue with the book. Malthus had accurately foretold the one phenomenon, but had missed the other altogether. Why? Because of the systematic pessimistic bias to which prophecy is prone. In 1798, the forthcoming increase in population was more predictable than the even larger increase in food supply, not because it was in any sense more probable, but simply because it depended less on the creation of knowledge. By ignoring that structural difference between the two phenomena that he was trying to compare, Malthus slipped from educated guesswork into blind prophecy. He and many of his contemporaries were misled into believing that they had discovered an objective asymmetry between what he called the power of population and the power of production. But that was just a parochial mistake. The same one that Mickelson and Lagrange made. They all thought they were making sober predictions based on the best knowledge available to them. In reality, they were all allowing themselves to be misled by the ineluctable fact of the human condition that we do not yet know what we have not yet discovered. Let me pause there. So, Martin Rees, Nick Bostrom, anyone else who thinks they can extrapolate based upon the best of today's knowledge into the future ignores that, that we can't know what we have not yet discovered. And so it wouldn't matter if you've got a wonderfully complex set of mathematical formulae and charts and graphs that you can extrapolate. Those charts and graphs, just as Malthus did all the way back in 1798, can lead you into gross error because you can't possibly hope to know what is going to be discovered tomorrow, let alone in 10 years, let alone in 100 years, that will completely change the calculus, completely change your priors, and therefore upset your Bayesian reasoning. It's not Bayesian reasoning, it's Bayesian unreason. David mentions their um, educated guesswork, and I just want to um, uh, go off on a little tangent about that as well. This, is, this would be a very narrow genre of epistemology, this, this concept of educated guesswork. It's rather, I suppose, the kind of thing that medical doctors might be often up to. So when you've got a complex system like the human body uh, and the time horizon on solving a particular problem in front of you is really short, so if we don't get the answer within the next few minutes or hours or you know, at most days, the patient might die. It's important we distinguish between wild guessing, which is what many of us might engage in if we're trying to figure out what's wrong with us medically, uh, and educated guesswork, which is what the experienced doctor might engage in, seeing the same symptoms. The latter, educated guesswork, is really about when we have competing good explanations, the same symptoms but different causes. We want to know the cause so we can find the appropriate treatment, and that would come with experience. Now this is rather unlike what happens with, let's say, climate change. There, the climate is also a complex system like the human body. However, the change that happens is not a matter of minutes, hours and days. The time horizon is far, far greater. It's a time horizon within which knowledge can be created by people that can affect the outcome. And lots of knowledge can be created in years and decades, the time in which the climate change is supposed to happen at earliest. At earliest, okay, many of the predictions are, you know, you're talking many decades or centuries. Now, this is unlike with a patient who has just come into the emergency department. The, the, the patient, the proverbial patient that's just turned up at the emergency department, 
our educated guesswork is required because nothing is going, no new knowledge is going to be created. No, no new explanatory theory is going to be sent down by the oncologists or by the medical scientists that is going to change the decision of that doctor within the next couple of minutes. That's extremely unlikely. However, for the expert climatologists that are trying to figure out what's going to happen with the climate and devise possible solutions for the climate, we're talking about, again, years to decades to centuries, a time during which the educated guesswork can be completely undone. The educated guesswork at that point is indistinguishable from blind guessing, from, from, from wild guessing, okay? Because we might very well create knowledge over the next few years that can completely change what the outcome is going to be. Okay, so David writes, neither Malthus nor Rees intended to prophesy. They were warning that unless we solve certain problems in time, we are doomed. But that has always been true, it always will be. Problems are inevitable. As I said, many civilizations have fallen. Even before the dawn of civilization, all of our sister species, such as the Neanderthals, became extinct through challenges with which they could have easily have coped had they known how. Genetic studies suggest that our own species came close to extinction about 70,000 years ago as a result of an unknown catastrophe, which reduced its total numbers to only a few thousand. Being overwhelmed by these and other kinds of catastrophe would have seemed to the victims like being forced to play Russian roulette. That is to say, it would have seemed to them that no choices that they could have made, except perhaps to seek the intervention of the gods more diligently, could have affected the odds against them. But this was a parochial error. Civilization starved long before Malthus because of what they thought of as the natural disasters of drought and famine. But it was really because of what we would call poor methods of irrigation and farming. In other words, lack of knowledge. Skipping a bit now. And then David writes, if a one kilometre asteroid had approached the Earth on a collision course at any time in human history before the early 21st century, it would have killed at least a substantial proportion of all humans. In that respect, as in many others, we live in an era of unprecedented safety. The 21st century is the first ever moment when we have known how to defend ourselves from such impacts, which occur once every 250,000 years or so. Now this may sound too rare to care about, but it is random. A probability of one in 250,000 of such an impact at any in any given year means that a typical person on Earth would have a far larger chance of dying of an asteroid impact than in an aeroplane crash. And the next such object to strike us is already out there at this moment, speeding towards us with nothing to stop it except human knowledge. Civilization is vulnerable to several other known types of disaster with similar levels of risk. For instance, ice ages occur more frequently than that, and mini ice ages occur much more frequently. And some climatologists believe that they can happen with only a few years warning. A supervolcano, such as the one lurking under Yellowstone National Park, could blot out the sun for years at a time. If it happened tomorrow, our species could survive by growing food using artificial light, and civilization could recover. But many would die, and the suffering would be so tremendous that such events should, be mer should merit almost as much preventative effort as an extinction. We do not know the probability of, of a spontaneously occurring incurable plague, but me we may guess that it is unacceptably high since pandemics such as the Black Death in the 14th century have already shown us the sort of thing that can happen on a time scale of centuries. Should any of these catastrophes loom, we now have at least a chance of creating the knowledge required to survive in time. We have a chance because we are able to solve problems. Problems are inevitable. We shall always be faced with the problem of how to plan for the, an unknowable future. We shall never be able to afford to sit back and hope for the best. Even if our civilization moves out into space, in order to hedge its bets, as Reese and Hawking both rightly advise, a gamma ray burst in our galactic vicinity would still wipe us all out. Such an event is thousands of times rarer than an asteroid collision, but when it does finally happen, we shall have no defense against it without a great deal more scientific knowledge and an enormous increase in our wealth. I'll pause there, this is my reflection. We should note there, as David does, the gamma ray bursts are known. At least we know they exist. But what about things we don't yet know about? Well, they're infinite, and in some sense, more scary. This is what is astonishing with the parochial way of thinking that animates people that are engaged in certain kinds of political discussions. Rather so often they are focused simply on this so-called big problem that requires all of us to donate massive resources towards, and worse, to curb wealth creation, the very thing that can help us with the problems that we don't yet know about. 
Wealth to many people is of course a dubious thing. It's an immoral thing. And this is another deeply religious notion. Uh, it comes to us via a bad cultural meme. The idea that poverty is a virtue, and it's not merely a Christian idea, the East has it as well, but the assumption is that the problems we have now are the biggest problems we will have tomorrow. And the heart of the problem, rather too often, is regarded as being us. And all of that is in fact the biggest problem. Okay, this idea that we are the cause of the biggest problems and these biggest problems that we have today are going to continue through to being the biggest problems tomorrow. But until we recognize that in fact, it is people who are the solution. And wealth is a great thing and we need, we need so much more of it to help fund people's creativity. So we can engage with these problems we haven't foreseen that might arise tomorrow or the next day. We may well end up causing events that bring to pass our own demise because we've slowed down our wealth creation too much, too quickly, or even at all. Any amount of slowing wealth creation and progress is very dangerous. This whole idea that, that we are the problem, there's too many people on the planet, um, begins with this rather religious type premise. It's sort of this, this idea from uh, Thomas Hobbes almost, that we're all evil, or the idea from you know, Genesis, that we're born with original sin. Um, we, we hear it, you know, that we, we should be careful about exploring the cosmos because we're going to pollute it as we've polluted the earth, polluted this planet. That's the environmentalist concern. And that we shouldn't have more children because people just exist in a state of suffering and to bring more people into the world is a terribly immoral thing. This is the anti-natalist's so-called view. The anti-natalists, I think, like the environmentalists, they, they, they all think they're on the side of morality. They think they're on the side of doing good. But morality is really, as David says elsewhere in the beginning of the infinity, that one moral injunction is not to destroy the means of error correction. And I suppose that has a, a few corollaries. That would mean we should increase the amount of error correction we have, not merely fail to destroy it, but also where we have the opportunity to, to increase our rate of error correction. How do we do that? Creativity. Who's creative? people. Therefore, we need more of them. We need more people to create the errors that we have. And the errors are infinite. And we will continue to be confronted by them. And of course, one way to do is just to have global suicide, to remove everyone, and then there is absolutely no problem at all. I think this is a terrible idea. But some people take it seriously. Some people think that people are evil. Whereas I think that people are a source of progress, and they're the only thing that can create good in this universe. So those who want to curb human life in one way, to treat us like some sort of cosmic virus, they're about curbing creativity. They're about reducing creativity in the form of us. They're about slowing down error correction, or perhaps stopping error correction altogether, if they can stop the birth of people. But given that people are the means of error correction, we need more of them. That's optimism. People are knowledge creators. So they reduce evil in the world. Okay, skipping a little bit, and then David writes. How can we formulate policies for the unknown if we cannot derive them from our best existing knowledge or from dogmatic rules of thumb like blind optimism or pessimism? Where can we derive them from? Like scientific theories, policies cannot be derived from anything. They are conjectures. And we should choose between them, not on the basis of their origin, but according to how good they are as explanations, how hard to vary. Like the rejection of empiricism and of the idea that knowledge is justified true belief, understanding that political policies are conjectures entails the rejection of a previously unquestioned philosophical assumption. Again, Popper was a key advocate of this rejection. He wrote, and this is one of my favorite passages that Popper did ever write, uh, it's a huge discovery in epistemology. In fact, uh, it really does form the core of Popper's epistemology. So let me read the quote that David has put into the beginning of infinity. Popper wrote, the question about the sources of our knowledge has always been asked in the spirit of what are the best sources of our knowledge, the most reliable ones, 
those which will not lead us into error, and those to which we can and must turn, in case of doubt, as the last court of appeal. I propose to assume, instead, that no such ideal sources exist, no more than ideal rulers, and that all sources are liable to lead us into error at times. And I propose to replace, therefore, the question of the sources of our knowledge by the entirely different question. How can we hope to detect and eliminate error? Knowledge Without Authority, 1960. Then David goes on. The question, how can we hope to detect and eliminate error, is echoed by Feynman's remark that science is what we have learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves. And the answer is basically the same for human decision making as it is for science. It requires a tradition of criticism, in which good explanations are sought. For example, explanations of what has gone wrong, what would be better, what effect various policies have had in the past, and what would have in the future. But what use are explanations if they cannot make predictions, and so cannot be tested through experience, as they can be in science? This is really the question, how is progress possible in philosophy? As I discussed in chapter 5, it is obtained by seeking good explanations. The misconception that evidence can play no legitimate role in philosophy is a relic of empiricism. Objective progress is indeed possible in politics, just as it is in morality generally and in science. Political philosophy, traditionally centred on a collection of issues that Popper called the who should rule question. Who should wield power? Should it be a monarch or aristocrats? Or priests or a dictator or a small group or the people or their delegates? And that leads to derivative questions such as, how should a king be educated? Who should be enfranchised in a democracy? How does one ensure an informed and responsible electorate? Just pause there, of course. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an article that uh, David and I like to tweet out rather regularly uh, when people begin to engage in these questions about who should rule. And it is the, um, the article from The Economist uh, that Popper wrote about what is democracy. It's about what, what is democracy. And democracy is about, of course, how to most easily remove rulers without violence rather than how to install certain rulers. But you do hear this today. You hear that certainly in Australia, I know the same discussion goes on in the United Kingdom and you, you hear it from uh, certain people in the United States as well about how we need a more scientifically literate um, um, politicians. We need, we need politicians who understand science more. Or we need more scientists in um, politics. I think, well, again, this is who should rule. But the person who should rule should have some sort of scientific understanding, and I don't understand that at all. Um, although one thing, if you listen to the, um, if you listen to the RSA uh, discussion between Martin Rees and David Deutsch, it was heartening to hear, actually, um, them both agree, uh, and uh, Martin Rees to talk about how he didn't really think it was a great idea for politicians to have a background in science. He would much rather them have a background in, let's say, history. Um, and I suppose if I had a bias one way or the other, I'd, I'd tend to agree with him on that. Okay, so back to the book. Popper pointed out that this class of questions is rooted in the same misconception as the question, how are scientific theories derived from sensory data? which defines empiricism. It is seeking a system that derives or justifies the right choice of leader or government from an existing idea, such as inherited entitlements, the opinion of the majority. The same misconception also underlies blind optimism and pessimism. They both expect progress to be made by applying a simple rule to existing knowledge to establish which future possibilities to ignore and which to rely on. Induction, instrumentalism, and even Lamarckism all make the same mistake. They expect explanationless progress. They expect knowledge to be created by fiat with few errors and not by a process of variation and selection that is making a continual stream of errors and correcting them. The defenders of hereditary monarchy doubted that any method of selection of a leader by means of rational thought and debate could be improved upon. Okay, I'm skipping a substantial bit here now um, and I'll just point people to of course the book and to um, Popper's important essay in The Economist as well. I'll have the link there um, at the bottom of this video and also put it up on the screen now. Um, and, but the, 
the, the, the, the central point here that David is making and which is echoing Popper here is that democracy is about trying to avoid violence. It's about it's this um, political system of non-violence. Instead of installing a ruler who is the best, because if the ruler is the best, then they should be kept there um, by some sort of force. And so the who should rule question, as Popper says, and the who should rule question really can be traced all the way back to Plato, begs for violent authoritarian answers and has often received them, uh, as David has written there, echoing Popper. Um, so I'll just read a, a very small part here uh, where David writes, <clears throat> Popper therefore applies his basic how can we detect and eliminate errors to political philosophy in the form of how can we rid ourselves of bad governments without violence? Just as science seeks explanations that are experimentally testable, so a rational political system makes it as easy as possible to detect and persuade others that a leader or policy is bad and to remove them without violence if they are. So there's this real um, uh, philosophy of, of, of um, non-violence. Um, it's absolutely crucial, I think, to, to Popper's political philosophy. And I've had some disagreements with people over the years about to what extent Popper believed in coercion. And I don't think he really did. It depends in some senses. He seems to have been a little more socialist and so on. But, but there's no point arguing. I don't think there's much point arguing about um, what Popper actually thought. I'd rather concentrate on the, the ideas. The idea being, what is the place of force and coercion in politics, if any? Well, it's remarkable to me how many people seem to think some level of initiating violence is necessary, state violence. Now, I'm not just talking about violence in response to violence. So if someone else initiates violence, you need some kind of um, police force to stop that violence or to, to respond to that violence or some guard or some you, you yourself take personal responsibility for um, responding to that initiation of violence. But there's many, many people who think the state should initiate violence um, and should be initiated against people who disagree with the policies of the state. Um, so, uh, you know, I, uh, for example, um, I've, I've listened to some professed optimists just to see how optimistic they are on this point. You've got Matthew Ridley, he wrote a book called The Rational Optimist. Um, Steven Pinker, probably the, 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 the so-called most prominent, probably the, the most prominent optimist, uh, rivals with David Deutsch as being labelled an optimist. But I don't find either of these people, Matthew Ridley or Steven Pinker, universally optimists, like the way David Deutsch is. Because both Ridley and Pinker, not to mention everyone else who's not an optimist, okay, which is everyone, um, they believe in the initiation of force by the state in order to address certain problems. They really do. At heart, they are both kind of with Thomas Hobbes. You know, they think there's some kind of inherent evil lurking there in people that needs to be tamed and controlled. Uh, Pinker's not a blank slatist, and nor am I, but he, like many other who throw in with the ideas of evolutionary psychology, think that what evolution has written onto our blank slates before birth um, really is quite bad in many ways. Not universally bad, not completely bad, but there are some bad aspects to our nature. And so we've got these genes for um, rape and genes for um, 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 violence uh, within us. And so um, even someone like Pinker, you know, the most celebrated of optimists, falls into terrible pessimism about people and what they're going to be compelled to do. It's like they take William Golding's The Lord of the Flies. If you've never read Lord of the Flies, you should read Lord of the Flies, um, or at least see the movie. This idea that um, left to their own devices, without state control, without some sort of um, um, imposition of power from the top, people will fall into violent anarchy and tyranny because of their genes are compelling them to violence. The thing is that every society has always been ruled by violence. It's been kept under control by a certain amount of violence. The state, the state is built on this kind of philosophy of, of violence. It's certainly built on a philosophy of pessimism, not, not optimism. Um, it should be no surprise that now and again, um, people do rebel against the state and the control of the state, uh, especially when they feel that the only way to rebel is through violence. So many religions, you know, Christianity, probably chief among them, um, views, views people as 
as inherently immoral in some way. They begin immoral and then it's this process of trying to become more moral over time. And it's not just the West, it's not just uh, Christianity here. In, in certain Asian cultures, historically, there was um, a kind of a version of Confucianism called legalism. And at its heart, it, it, it saw people as immoral as well. And so the idea there is that you need the strong state in order to control these evil people. Most organisation, most organised religion is kind of based upon this kind of principle. Um, there's some something wrong with people um, inherently, and so they cannot be relied upon to not fall into complete and utter anarchy left to their own devices. We're born tainted, we're born evil, not good, and this is a pessimistic view of what humans are and the potential of humans. So I'm skipping just a, a small amount here, and then David writes. Thus, systems of government are to be judged not for their prophetic ability to choose and install good leaders and policies, but for their ability to remove bad ones that are already there. That entire stance is fallibilism in action. It assumes that rulers and policies are always going to be flawed, that problems are inevitable, but it also assumes that improving upon them is possible. Problems are soluble. The ideal towards which this is working is not that nothing unexpected will go wrong, but that when it does, it will be an opportunity for further progress. Okay, I'm going to pause there. That's the end of this part. And um, yeah, there's still much more to, to, to read and to comment upon.